Mr. Swallow, we've handed you Exhibit 2, which is uh, uh, two invoices and two emails. Um, did you prepare these documents? That looks like I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you look at the third page, which is Bates page 67, it, it looks like a note to Richard Rawl from you that is the same thing as the text in the uh, Bates page 68 email. Do, do you know what the difference between, uh, do, do you recall if you wrote him uh, an email and a separate note? No, I think, I think it's just simply a matter of a printing difference. Okay. But that's my, my guess. I was having a hard time knowing how to print an email off my computer. Okay. By the way, speaking of computers, um, Jennifer corrected me. It, I said that my hard disk crashed on my home computer in January of 2012. I meant to say January of 2013, just this past January. Okay. But no, I think that those are the same email, but just simply a different program printed them. Okay. Well, uh, let, let me direct your attention to the two invoices then, if I could. And the first page... Um, is the $15,000 one, is that the one you have? That's correct. Okay. And th this would have been, as we were describing before the break, uh, you, you went to Richard and suggested that he pay you on an hourly rate uh, sometime in the fall of 2010. That's correct. Okay. And do you recall... Uh, when you provided him with this invoice? I mean, was it simultaneous with the emails attached, which would have been around April 8th of 2011? No, no. Actually, the answer to that is no. Um, these, two, these two detailed invoices were created after the meeting I, I had with Jeremy Johnson at the donut shop. So okay, so the, these, 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 these two emails were, were prepared sometime after April 30, 2012. These two um, documents, they're not emails, but documents, yes, they were prepared sometime after April 30th of 2012. Uh, let's, can we refer to the first two pages as invoices? Sure. Because you're right, they're not emails, and I misspoke. That's okay. Um, the, the, what you're telling me is the two invoices, Bates pages 65 and 66, were prepared after April 30, 2012. That's correct. Uh, why did you prepare them at that point in time? Well, in the meeting I had with Jeremy Johnson, he brought up an issue that concerned me. He, 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 he intimated that I might have gotten paid for the transaction between him and Richard. And the tone of the meeting made me feel that he could very well make up a story that would be intended to injure me or hurt me. And so following that meeting, I telephoned Richard. I asked him if I had been paid from the same account as he'd received money from Jeremy Johnson. And I sent him a letter I don't remember if I sent him a letter or hand-delivered a letter to him, but I created a letter um, telling him that I was concerned about that and wanting to get with him about, I, mean, I don't remember exactly what the letter says, but I also took steps at that point in time to try to document as best as I could the work I had done with him, for him, on the cement project. So I went back and tried to document the work I had done the time frames I'd done the work in, and then I met with him to verify with him his recollection of what I'd done and when. Then I finalized these invoices and gave them to him at that time. Okay. Um, the purpose was to document, though, because I was concerned that Jeremy Johnson might try to create a false reality, and I was concerned about that. Um. Did he contribute to your attorney general campaign? 
I think he did. Okay. I, 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 th I think he did um, directly to my campaign or to a PAC that was associated with my campaign or to a PAC that was associated with a Mark Shirtless campaign. I can't remember how he contributed, but he contributed to a shotgun event that we held in the fall of 2012. Okay, and if it had been contributed to a PAC, would that have shown up on your campaign disclosures? Whatever the rules were, they would have been followed. I had a professional treasurer who tracked all of that and reported all of that. So you don't know the answer? Well, for example, if, if a campaign contribution was made to Mark Shirtless PAC, for example, and Mark Shirtliff later donated to my campaign through his PAC, I don't know if that would have shown up as a contribution from Richard Rawl to my campaign, so I'm not sure I can answer your question without you know, digging into things. Do you know how much money Mr. Rawl contributed to your Attorney General campaign through whatever means he used? I don't know. And, and I would just say this. Um, I want to make sure we're very clear on this. You just said to my, my campaign through whatever vehicle he might have used. Um, a donation made to a PAC that's controlled by Mark Shirtloff um, that has a certain amount of money is not necessarily or even reasonably construed as a, a donation of my campaign. So. I, I don't want you to, to make it look like I'm testifying that a donation of Mark Shirtless Pack was a donation to me. I'm not saying that. I, I mean, you say you don't want to make this a payday race. Right. That, that suggests to me that you were concerned about being labeled a payday loan type candidate. Is that a correct inference? Well, I, I think that I didn't want to be a one issue candidate. And um, I know that the, you know, um, with my having been a lobbyist in the industry, I felt like, you know, I needed to have a breadth of support from financial institutions, from real estate in institutions, from other industries, so that I would be known as a more of a well-rounded candidate. So that was my real purpose in asking him in paragraph seven to raise money from companies and individuals not simply tied to payday. Uh, the last, uh, or the second to last thing you say here is not to forward the email. What was your concern in that regard? I think I think it's self-explanatory. Self Emails that are forwarded can be f forwarded in perpetuity. So was I don't, have, some, I don't have anything else really to say about that. Was there something in the body of that email that you did not want uh, to be disseminated more broadly? Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I do know that the payday industry nationally was sensitive to um, a lot of backlash they received, and PR was always a big thing for them as well. And so um, I can't explain more than I have that I wanted to be well-rounded, and this was a person who had committed to raise some money for me. Were, were there any of the points you laid out to Kip and uh, in this email that you, you thought were not well suited for public dissemination? I think it's, I, well, one thing, I think it sounded pretty um, arrogant of me to say that I would be the clear front runner right from the get-go if I announced. And I think it was fairly um, interesting that I said that um, the Republican is going to win this race by 30 points. So I was pretty bold. Anything else that you think you may have wanted to just keep between you and Kip? Well, I had, uh, my budget would be a million one. I mean, there's, 
Isn't yeah. that public, though? I mean, your campaign contribution. Well, not in June of 2011. It's, my goals aren't public. What I think I'm, I'm going to need to budget and spend on my campaign is not public. That's more campaign strategy. And so there are several things in this letter as I look at it that, you know, I wanted to have it be on my a very close team or a finance team rather than have it distributed widely or, or put a forward and gone out to who knows who. And did you believe at that time that if the statements that you got in this letter were disseminated more broadly that that somehow may negatively affect your campaign? Well, look at what the Tribune's done with the things that have been said about me now and how um, they've attacked me for the most incredible statements made by people. And I felt that anything I said that would be, you know, bold or audacious would be something that would be looked at by those who wanted to hurt me or take me down or win a race. Now, I understand at some point uh, you made an introduction uh, of Johnson to Richard Rawl. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, was that the first time you'd heard about the, his problems with the FTC, or was there a prior occasion? Or I, occasions? I believe there was a prior occasion, and, and um, you, know, um, you know, the Attorney General, myself, and Orrin Hatch met with. Uh, Jeremy Johnson, I believe, before I made the introduction to Richard Rawl about the FTC help, I believe. But it's been long enough that I'm not quite sure. Uh, the meeting with you and uh, Mark Shirtliff and Orrin Hatch, where and when did that occur? It happened sometime in August or September of 2010 at uh, the offices of Senator Hatch here in Salt Lake. Who called that meeting? I think Mark Shirtliff did. What was the purpose of the meeting? Uh, as I recall, Jeremy Johnson wanted to explain to Senator Hatch the FTC was not listening to him, that uh, they didn't understand what his business was doing, and he, he wanted uh, someone like Senator Hatch to maybe reach out to the FTC and ask them to at least sit down with him and understand what his company was doing. And he'd had just brick walls since then, prior to that point in time. Uh, in that meeting, were you and uh, Mr. Shirtliff acting in an official capacity on behalf of the Attorney General's office? I don't believe so at all, no. In what capacity were you as, acting? As friends of Jeremy Johnson. Okay. Uh, can you recall how the referral request came about? And by that I mean the referral to Richard Rawl. Well, um, I, I don't recall specifically. Can you recall whether it was your idea or his? I think it was mine. And do you recall, did you call him? Did it happen at the meeting with Senator Hatch? Was there some other event? Well, um, so, so Jeremy, Jeremy had um, had some involvement with Czech City prior to um, the time when I, when I suggested he give Richard Rawl a call and see if they wanted to work together on an FTC project. That happened even before I was uh, employed by the Office of the Attorney General. So he had already had some relationship with some of the members of that company. Um, and I don't recall the moment I talked to Richard about that, but I recall sitting down with Richard over lunch sometime, maybe talking about something else. Um, it was about the time I got started on the cement project, so it wouldn't be unusual for him and I to have spent time together and just said, I've got a friend, you know him, who is having a problem getting his story in front of the FTC. And, and I don't know much about the FTC and the lobbying of the FTC, and I can't do it myself. And he said that he had lobbyist relationships that he thought might make a difference. He was going to check it out. And he made some phone calls, and then he got back to me and said, we'd be interested in talking to Jeremy, but it'll be expensive. And it went from there. Uh, whose idea was it to uh, try to reach out to Senator Reid? I think that was Richard Rawls' idea. 
and, and it wasn't to Senator Reid, it was really to Senator Reid's, well, maybe it was indirectly through a lobbyist friend, Richard Head. I think his name is Jay Brown in Las Vegas. But wasn't the ultimate goal to get Senator Reid to try to assist Senator Hatch in lobbying the FTC? I think that that looked to Richard like an avenue that could work for Jeremy because Jeremy wanted a meeting with the FTC, he wanted them to understand things. And I think that's what Richard kind of strategized would work the best. When you had the idea to introduce uh, Jeremy Johnson to Richard Rawl, what was the full idea? And what, what did you think would come from that introduction? Well, again, I had a friend, Jeremy Johnson, who was having some concerns with the FTC. And his statement to me was, I've spent a million dollars on lawyers, they haven't gotten me anywhere. And I said, have you thought about, you know, maybe hiring a lobbyist to see if you can maybe get in the door that way? Because all he wanted to do was tell a story and wasn't getting anywhere. So I don't know, your question was? I'm just wondering, well, uh, what I've understood you to say is that the, the idea to approach Harry Reid was not yours. Right. But you also told me it was your idea to introduce him to Richard. Yes. And so I'm, I'm trying to, to flush out the fullness of your idea. If, if your idea was not to have Richard somehow get to Harry Reid, what was your idea? Did it go beyond Richard or did you just... No, I, again, um, having worked with Richard for a number of years, I knew that he, at some point, if not then, was the uh, public affairs um, chairman of the National Payday Lending Association. So he had interfaced quite a bit, and I'd actually interfaced with some of the national lobbyists when I worked with uh, Czech City through my firm. So, um, so I basically knew Richard had contacts in Washington. I knew that Jeremy was looking for someone, and at least open to the idea of looking for someone that could be maybe a better resource to him than his attorneys were. And so I, I thought that those two should talk and see if they could work out something that would work for, and solve Jeremy's problems with the FTC. Uh, if not Senator Reid, who did you envision would be lobbied by Richard and his contacts? Um, I, I, I think Richard told me that he had a good contact with Senator Reid, a good lobbyist for Senator Reid, and I thought that was a great idea. So I didn't really go much further than that. Um, there was a man named Tim Repley that I knew from... Um, my days working in the industry. Um, I didn't know exactly who Richard would be using, but I'm sure he would have consulted with, with uh, Mr. Repley as well, who was a, a, the paid lobbyist for, full-time lobbyist for the Payday Lending Association nationally. Um, after making the introduction uh, of Johnson and Rawl, what, if anything, did you do in furtherance of the lobbying effort? Well, I simply, um, I, I, I know I prepared an email, a, a note, uh, either for Jeremy, I think it was for Jeremy, talking about how I would position um, his attempt to get an audience with the FTC and what I would talk about. Um, and so I know I had at least that involvement. Um, again, that was, that was uh, to assist Jeremy in the strategy. Returning on the record, 3.13 p.m. is the time. Council. Uh, exhibit 34 is uh, a series of emails, September 29, 2010. And I want to direct your attention to the one that begins on the middle of the first page from you to Jeremy Johnson. Do you see that? That's right. It says, meeting with Harry Reid's contact. Right. Uh, I mean, it looks to me like by this point in time, the notion of connecting, well, the notion of the target of the lobbying effort being ha Harry Reid had already been determined. Is that accurate? It's, it's been so long. Just can I yeah, review please this? Please Thanks. Do.
Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so your question was, by this time, yeah. Sure, it looks like the notion of the, of Harry Reid being the target of the lobbying effort had been determined. That was the game plan by this point in time. Well, certainly, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that by this time, I, I, I knew that Richard Rawl knew a person close to Harry Reid and that Richard thought it would be a good idea to go through Harry Reid, yes. Right. But, uh, and I'm, I want to make sure I get the chronology correct and also who's I, who had what idea. Sure. What, what I'm understanding you to say is when you first had the idea of introducing Jeremy to Richard uh, for, for some kind of connections, right. you were somewhat vague about what those connections might be. You didn't have in mind. No, I didn't have in mind okay. Harry Reid. Uh, you didn't have, and, and Harry Reid as best you can recall, was somebody who was, that was an issue raised by Richard or someone, not you. Right, okay. right. I believe it was raised by Richard. But by this point in time, which is late September, obviously that had already happened. Richard had raised the idea of Harry Reid. Right. And you are proposing a narrative uh, in this email that refers to Senator Reid and uh, seeing if he would be willing to encourage FTC investigators to take a close look. Correct? Right. I believe that's correct. And so uh, what I'm really trying to understand here is what was your role here? And, and th it appears to me that it's gone beyond merely making an introduction to Richard Rawl to the point where you're you're suggesting a narrative, uh, but what, 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 what was your role as you understood it? Well, my role, I was just Jeremy Johnson's friend and introduced him to Richard Rawl. And having had experience myself as a lobbyist in my prior practice and caring about Jeremy Johnson and understanding how he is having a, a real problem getting in front of the FTC and knowing that I couldn't do it myself because of my job. I wanted to help him understand how I might position this if I were him as a friend. Okay. Based so upon your my role is, lobbying is, experience. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure this was a narrative for Harry Reid or a narrative, uh, a narrative for the FTC, or I'm not sure who that narrative is for. Right. Well, I know what it's for. It was simply my advice to Jeremy as a friend. Here's how I would tell my story if I had a chance to get in front of the FTC. Yeah. This was not intended to go to Harry Reid. This was just some advice to Jeremy as a friend. Okay, maybe I'm misunderstanding this. Um, the subject of the email is Harry Reid's contract, or meeting with Harry Reid's contract, right? The contact, you mean? Contact, sorry. And then uh, the email begins, I spoke with Richard Rawl about the contact information for Harry Reid's guy. Richard is traveling to Las Vegas tomorrow and will a be able to contact this person who he has a very good relationship with. He needs a brief narrative of what is going on and what you want to happen. And then if you skip down to the next paragraph, which is just an introduction, it says, here is the narrative I'd propose. You see that? Right. I'm understanding this as you proposing what would be said to Harry Reid's guy. Is that incorrect? Well, a lobbyist who knows Harry Reid. I'm not sure what you mean by Harry Reid's guy. It's not my terminology. Harry Reid's guy. 
That's his terminology. Look at the first sentence. Well, yeah, sure. Well, I don't see it. I don't see the big deal. I mean, I'm telling you that um, my point in drafting this was to let Jeremy Johnson know what I was thinking about how I would position a story to get in front of the FTC. That, that's, that's why I sent this email to Jeremy Johnson. That's why I didn't just pick up the phone or send this email to Richard and say, Richard, why don't you just say this? This was not my, this was not my project. This was me telling a friend through my experience this is how I would approach this issue with the FTC or with the person who's going to talk with the FTC. I was puzzled and curious through the whole conversation as to why the FBI would have any interest in me. And after I settled down when the conversation was over, and as a few weeks passed, I became convinced that he was just trying to put pressure on me and scare me. Um, and when I, you know, continued to move forward in the primary and nothing happened, I became more and more convinced he was just trying to push my buttons. After you got out of this meeting and thought about it? Well, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I asked a question in this interview. I said, is there a paper trail? And talk about the houseboat. And people have asked me, why did you say that? And it was because I was trying to find some connection between anything I had done with Jeremy Johnson. Because I didn't, I didn't see we had anything that would even lead the FBI to even ask and have me wonder if there was any real relationship or involvement between us. So I, was, I spent the whole meeting trying to figure out where he was going and trying to connect dots to see if he was telling me the truth. And by, by the time I'm halfway through this meeting, I'm thinking, he's setting me up. He's trying to make me nervous. He's trying to scare me. And I'm just trying to hang on through the meeting and not make him upset enough that he was going to storm out of there and do something terrible to me and make up something. Okay. So I was really trying to hang with him. Uh, let me direct you to page 18. Beginning on line 22, there's a statement uh, where you refer to, uh, well, I'm, I'm picking up on line 24. There's nothing wrong with anything that I've done criminally. Now, politically, I go, whoa. Um, what did you mean by that? Well, I, what I really meant there was someone could really make up a story if they wanted to lie about my relationship with Jeremy Johnson. Which is exactly what happened. So I was worried about the impact of what he could say if he were to lie about it on me politically. Okay. So was your I mean, the, the, the notion of criminal suggests to me that your concern, at least in that moment, may have been even deeper than political. Well, Is that accurate? No, no. I wasn't concerned that I'd done anything criminally wrong. Okay. Not a thing. No, it was all about the appearance. And this statement that I make here on page 18 is in the context of the last 17 pages of this guy acting crazy on me. Prior to this, prior to this moment, it never crossed my mind that Jeremy Johnson would be able to say those things or have an interest in painting that kind of a picture with me. How would you describe your, I mean, what, the, the nature of your concern as a result of this? Was it simply what you said about it, it would, would hurt your political campaign a month before the primary? Did it go beyond that? Uh, well, so. Yes, the answer is that was the concern for me, was, was the campaign. Because I think for the first time ever, I heard in, in the prior moments of the conversation, his talking about 
um, a, bribe, a bribe attempt of all things. And putting this in, the, in an ugly context rather than a, a, an honorable context. And I, I, I started to see what I've come to feel is the real Jeremy Johnson, which I'd never known that man before. And it scared me to death. Was this a turning point in your relationship? Absolutely. With him? Okay. How, how would you describe the level of your concern about the political repercussions? I mean, was this. I mean, on one hand, you've said he's crazy, but I'm also getting the sense that you were taking this seriously. Well, I mean, to say I wasn't taking it seriously is not to read the transcript. I was concerned. I was, yeah. He'd scared me to death. He, he'd become a monster about what he'd be willing to do. And he acknowledged, on the one hand, that I hadn't done anything like what he was suggesting he could say I'd done. Well, on the other hand, he was saying... I can get it all over the papers, all over the news. You'll become a pariah. And, and I understood campaigning well enough to know that in a couple of weeks, that could be very hard to recover from in just a short period of time. Uh, had you had this, uh, the, the concern you had as a result of this meeting, had you had that prior? I mean, for example, when you met with him in late 2011. Did you have concerns that Johnson may somehow turn on you? I didn't. I didn't have any concerns about that. Uh, had you talked with Jason Powers about Johnson prior to this meeting? I don't, I don't think so. Not, not in that context at all. And yeah. No, I, 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 I wouldn't have met with Jeremy Johnson if I felt like he had the capacity to do what he did to me in this meeting. In fact, that was the last time I ever met with him. Let me have you go to page 52. On line 21, you say, I think I'm their target. What did you mean by that? I'd have to read, I just have to read the context. Sure. So what's your question? Well, I'm interesting. Uh, what was your concern was my uh, question. Well, by this time, I think I'd been in this conversation for an hour with this guy. Um, I'm trying to hold on to the conversation to the very end so that he doesn't leave upset. And um, I think I'm just trying to be as conciliatory as I can be. And I'm frankly worried. Uh, who's target and target for what? I, uh, I don't recall. Uh huh. Is you know you're you're talking about being someone's target. You're talking about being a felon. And I'm just wondering if there's some context to this discussion that doesn't come through in the transcript. Where, well, except where, that, where you would well, be concerned about being someone's target, particularly a criminal target. Well, I think that the the only 
the, I think the only way to look at the conversation is in the context of the conversation. And I've got a guy who looks like he's going off the reservation. I don't know what he's saying to anybody. Um, and I don't know what he's willing to make up. And, you know, I'll tell you, maybe it was a, a premonition. Because eight months later, I find myself what? You know, someone else alleges that I've tried to bribe a senator. I call for an investigation, and I'm thoroughly turned upside down and, you know, investigated for 10 months. At some point, I probably become a target. And so, in a context of this whole emotional meeting for me f with a friend, after an hour and a half, I'm just hanging on, trying to get through a conversation, being as agreeable as I can be, get it finished without him getting so mad that he's just going to go make up something and ruin my life. That's, that's the context of where I am at this point in time in the conversation. Were these, these efforts, the refunding of the money, the writing of the letter, the creating of the invoices, was that sort of a, a, an attempt to, to preempt or even if not preempt, explain yourself if and when this became public? I, I think that what I wanted to do as soon as I found out it could become an issue possibly, while the recollection was as, as fresh on my mind and Richard's mind as possible, knowing it was a year later, without too much time going by, to try to document our relationship, the work I had done on the project, and which was hard enough going back a year, and have things documented so that if I ever needed to go back, and if there was ever a question, I'd have the most contemporaneous recollection I could possibly have, contemporaneous to the events and to when I'd found out that the money had come from the same account. Okay. Because re basically Jeremy Johnson in the, in the phone conversation said that he thought I might have gotten paid on his other issue. And so the, the Krispy Kreme conversation. And so I wanted to, while Richard was still alive, while it was fresh on my mind, go back and try to, to document exactly what we'd done, what I'd done, and what I'd been paid for. Okay. So was the audience for this message ultimately the voting public? I wouldn't say it was just the voting public. I think it was anybody who would be interested at some point in time, including the court, including anybody. Okay. And the nature of your concern from the Krispy meeting, Krispy Kreme meeting was that you, you would be harmed politically given the impending primary election. Well, immediately at that time, it was the primary, but it was also about my reputation. It was about casting what I had done legitimately in a false light, where Richard and I had had a relationship that didn't require a lot of documentation in our experience with each other. And in your mind, writing the letter, preparing the invoices, returning the money, that accomplished your objective? Well, no, but it certainly gave me a reference point to document what we had done, where Richard and I could contemporaneously work together to, and that's, that's what I did on the invoices, I think I may have talked about it earlier, that uh, I went back to him, we went over what I'd done, and did the best I could to document and reconstruct the relationship that we had relative to those projects. Exhibit 41 is the Richard Rawl Declaration. Uh, you've seen this, correct? I have. Uh, uh, how was this prepared, do you know? Well, Richard was really um, getting sick and taking a downturn. And I believe I prepared some notes that I gave to my lawyer. And I believe he prepared a draft. And I believe it was sent over to Court Walker. And Court Walker revised it extensively, I believe and finalized it, and then presented it to Richard through uh, his attorney, and uh, reviewed it with him. 
That's uh, wh whose idea was it to have um, Richard do a declaration? Was that your idea? No, I don't think it was my idea. I think that the attempt was to preserve his testimony because he was his death was imminent. But I don't know whose idea it was. I don't think it was my idea. And testimony for what purpose? Well, uh, by that time, I had been told by Mark Shirtliff that um, Jeremy Johnson had gone to the Tribune, and Jeremy Johnson had gone to Mark Shirtliff, and Mark Shirtliff had gone to the FBI. And Jeremy Johnson had been raising allegations. This was in November of 2012, after the election. And so, with the anticipation that someone might ask questions about our relationship based on what we were hearing, the, I think that the point of this was to preserve Mr. Rawls' testimony in case he passed away. Do you know uh, what, if any, changes Mr. Rawl made to the draft that your lawyer prepared? I don't. I don't know specifically what changes they were. When you say my lawyer prepared or I prepared? Did you I thought I, you told me your lawyer prepared yeah, this. Right. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, is that fair? I mean, I think that's what happened. Yeah, but it went to uh, Alan this Young. lawyer. Yeah, Alan Young. Cool, yeah. Okay. Okay. Did, did, okay. did you did you talk to Richard about this declaration, or did you just work through your attorney and Court Walker? I don't believe I talked to him about the declaration. I believe it was worked through Court Walker and uh, and his attorney. Did you see him in the hospital during this time frame? I did, but not not discussing the declaration. That's right. And was your concern in preparing the declaration that you might end up in exactly the type of investigations you've ended up in? Well, I think you testified you prepared the declaration. That's what you're suggesting. Um, yeah, so tell me what your... What your well, uh, yeah. Uh, you knew this declaration was being prepared, correct? Right. And you agreed with that? I wanted to make sure that, I mean... Right. Yes or no? Did I agree with that? Did I agree with the fact that it was being prepared? Yes. Why would you be concerned about an entity like P-Solutions or SSV Management? You know, that's a, that's a great question looking back on it now. Because if I had, had any idea that this would blow up this way, I would have figured out, I, would have, I probably would have stayed on and just disclosed it because, again, they, they, I was already publicly on the record on those companies. I mean, anybody who does a corporate search under my name will see that at one point I was a manager of Peace Solutions. So it wasn't about hiding that I was involved in Peace Solutions. It was about sending a message to me that going forward, I'm not involved in these companies anymore. Well, why, and this is a disclosure form about past activities, not a declaration of future activities. So why would not disclosing P-Solutions or, or SSV management satisfy the objective of convincing the voters that you wouldn't have outside interests? Well, no, actually, part of it is and part of it isn't. I mean, the part about the $5,000 or more within the prior year, that is about the past. But the part about name of organization for, or entity for which the fighter serves on the board of directors or in any other formal advisor capacity is about the future. It's about the moment in time in the future. How, That's, have, you, how have you reached that conclusion? Well, because it doesn't say anything about the past. Have you read the statute? Well, since then I have. And I think it confirms what I'm saying. Okay. Now, if it doesn't, then excuse me for not reading the statute. But I'm assuming, as I sit here, that it, this mirrors the statutory language, and I believe it does. I've read it since then. And so my thinking was, well, these, these companies have not really been engaged in business for, the, for I, aware, I aware for a long time. And Peace <coughs> Solutions, I hadn't done any consulting for Peace Solutions for at least six months. I had no plans to do future consulting with Peace Solutions. The cement project had gone away. Um, and so I felt like, you know, I can dissolve these companies 
And if I had dissolved these companies on the spot, the same, it would have been a non-disclosure as well. I could have dissolved them, or I could, I could resign as manager. And my thinking was, I don't want to just dissolve these things because who knows, someday I may want to get back involved in things after I'm done with Attorney General. I've spent the money to organize these things. I've got the trust. And even though the trust hadn't been utilized, and I'll say it, I mean, you know, very carefully. And I went over that with Lee as well. I said, I haven't followed all the formalities on the trust. Does that make a difference? He said, absolutely not. This isn't a distribution from the trust. He said, it doesn't matter. You're not legally entitled to that income. Therefore, this is not income to the filer. And I, I got to tell you, Matt, I regret every single day looking back on it that I didn't you know, just stay on the board, stay as a manager, and just disclose it. Because if I'd had any idea Jeremy Johnson was going to do this, if I'd had any idea that Peace Solutions would become this embroiled, I mean, there wasn't, you've seen the numbers. This wasn't a big project. This wasn't like for three years I'd conspired to do something crazy with this thing. And so that was the thought process I had at the time I made these disclosures. And I, and I testify under oath that at the time I filed this form, my intent was to be fully accurate and fully honest and not to hide anything from, from the public in any kind of a, a deceitful manner. That's my testimony, and that's with the conviction of my heart. And so I wanted to be careful, though, and do the right thing. I talked to my lawyer. And that's not all I did. I, I wanted to be very careful. and. Um, you know, I went down and saw him down in Provo with the forms. And he came with the same conclusion as we really dug into it for a little longer. And then, because I wanted to be extra careful before the 15th, and I don't know if it was before or after, but I think it was before. I don't know why I would have talked to Tom Roberts after the 15th, because after I filed this the last time, I forgot about it and moved on. I met with the, I think, the preeminent election lawyer in the state who represents the elections office. And I think it was on the phone. But I described to him what I'd done, what I had, and the advice I'd gotten from Lee McCullough. And the first thing he said to me was, this sounds a little funny. Let me look into it. And then he called me back or came back to me a few days later or a little while later, and he said, you know what, John, you're right. It says income to the filer. That's a reasonable position to take. Did you have, was the non-disclosure based in any part on a concern about uh, how that might be perceived politically? I don't think so, Matt. No, not at the time. What Was it even a thought in your mind no. or a small factor? No, I, I, no, I'll say no. Okay. And similarly with respect to the withdrawal, was the, the uh, reason for withdrawing as manager You've said you, you wanted to uh, tell the public that you weren't going to have outside interests. Right. Uh, was a desire to prevent any investigation into P-Solutions or Chaparral or Richard Rall, was that part of the analysis or decision-making at no. all? No, it wasn't. Not even a factor? It wasn't, it wasn't a factor, Matt. And I, I knew that because I know how campaigns work well enough to know that any reporter, any candidate that you're running against is going to just do a quick search on John Swallow business and they're going to pull everything I've ever done. I wasn't trying to hide it, it was already public. I was trying to send a message that I'm a committed attorney general candidate and I'm moving forward. And I hadn't done work for almost six months at the time. <laughs>